The purpose of the next panel is uh, the one that I, and, and it's been alluded to a couple of times today, is, is the free economy. Um, the, um, this is, we, we consume a lot of data on the internet and it's paid for by advertising, particularly targeted advertising, which is driven by data. And this is something that has stirred a lot of political debate um, in Europe and in the United States, especially over the last few weeks. So I think this conversation is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so I'd first like to welcome to the stage uh, Rennie Arnold, who is the head of Department for Markets and Perspectives at WIC, which is the Wissenschaftliche Institute for Infrastructure and Kommunikationsdienste, I believe. Uh, the, the Scientific Institute for Infrastructure and Communication Services. Uh, Rene, your, your uh, nameplate should be at the end of the, in that pile there. It might be tied with somebody else's, but it is definitely there. Um, find your name and, and place it in front of you. Uh, the second person I'd like to invite is Benedict Blumeyer, who is a policy officer at Allied for Startups, which is a trade association representing uh, startups in Europe. Um, actually, not just Europe. Um, I'd like to invite Townsend Fian, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Interactive Advertising Bureau um, Europe. And again, uh, grab a bottle of water and grab your nameplate from the end of the table. Um, I'd like to invite Michaela Palladino, who is the Director of European Policy and Government Affairs at the Developers Alliance, which is also a trade association representing um, app developers. And finally, I'd like to invite Cecilia Zappala, a, who is a policy manager at Facebook. And again, if you grab a bottle of water, if there's none left on that table, there, there'll be a spare one at the end of the desk here, and grab your nameplate, and we can get started. You've all found your names, that's great. Okay, so we all know why we're here, we all know the purpose of the panel. Uh, I'm going to start with a fairly sort of straightforward question for Rene. Um, why is there so much free stuff on the internet? Why don't, why don't I have to pay for so much uh, of what I use online? And what is the role of data in paying for it? All right. Um, well, actually, most of the stuff that we have on the internet is not really free in that sense because as you say we do pay with the things we do with the services how we interact with those services and in particular um, and i think that's the thing you're alluding to the fact that we pay attention to well advertising but also um, content of say the other party that seeks to well let's say rent an apartment or sell a car on an online service which well quite often are um, organized as online platforms, meaning that they serve not just one side of the of market, but actually two or even multiple sides of markets, which means that they have a kind of intermediary function to align the interests of all those groups of users. Um, and the ones that do that best um, seem to be the most successful ones. So. Um, Yes, we do not necessarily pay with money, but we do pay with the things that we do and the attention that we give to, to advertising. So this, is, this idea of, of paying with advertising is, is it, those, those of you who've, as I have, read academic literature on, literature on advertising can be very exciting and fascinating. It's a very old idea, predates the digital economy, it goes back to the 1980s. There was, there was a, a, a theory that people work for broadcasters by uh, watching ads. Um, is, how, how sound is this idea? I mean, how, how would the rest of the panel like to respond to the idea that by paying attention, we're paying? Or, or is, is this the right way of thinking about it? Tanzan, I mean, you, you work for, you represent advertisers, so I'm going to in, invite you in here. Well, I would say, I would say um, it, it's sort of a helpful idea, actually, in a way, because we, we would certainly say that there is a transaction that takes place. When you, as a user, 
are on a site that you're able to watch without having to pay for it. Um, you're getting something of value, and you're providing something of value. You're providing something of value to an advertiser, uh, which is your receptiveness or willing to be, um, willingness to be exposed to an ad. So I, I, I think we would say that the, the, this notion that there is a value exchange that takes place um, is, is an important and constructive one um, that would, should help um, get to um, sensible policy outcomes that preserve the possibility um, to continue to benefit from all the availability that one has at the moment. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring policy in here because, so we've established that free content on the internet is paid for by advertising. I mean, I don't think there's anybody here who didn't know that when they walked in. I was setting the scene. Um, so we've talked a lot today about the GDPR, which obviously is, is in place. It's not going to change. What is still up in the air and not settled yet is the privacy regulation. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to assume that everybody in the room has been following the privacy regulation. But there are um, rules both in the Commission's proposal but also in the amendments that Parliament has put forward on e-privacy regarding... Um, advertising, and particularly in the parliamentary amendments, there is this requirement that you would have to give people a choice between targeted ads and some other alternative. Um, they don't stipulate what that could be. It could be payments, it could be non-targeted ads, it could be a free lunch. Um, what effect would would that and, and you know, some of the other requirements around cookies, for example, in, in e-privacy have on um, online advertising and, 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 and on the content that online advertising supports so on, on, on free content. Um, I think I can see Benedict's... Uh, if, if, I should say to panellists, if you look at me, I'm going to point at you <laughs> and ask you to speak. So, Benedict, I'm going to let you come in there. Sure. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I agree with the big picture here. Uh, startups, in our case, are working really hard to be GDPR compliant by next month. Um, and, you know, before this new regulation comes into play, uh, you know, we've been traveling as Allied for Startups to our members across Europe and talking to them about the next uh, piece of regulation which is coming. And uh, for many of the founders, this is um, you know, contrary to how they would be working on, on, on issues. They would you know, try something out and have an iteration process and improve it. Um, and now, all of a sudden, you know, while this big regulation is, is, is in the pipeline, the, um, you know, we're, we're going to them, talking to them about something completely, you know, beyond that. Um, so, I mean, I would, I would just maybe throw in a, a, a example. I think we, we met the, 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 the founders of gutefrage.net at an event by the app developers, and I think they're a great case. It's an Ask Me Anything uh, platform, and they, um, so they're one of the most visited sites in Germany, and they um, estimated, I think, that if they uh, did not have targeted ads um, in this case, that their revenue would go down by about 50%. I think that's what they said. Um, and this is a, a, an Ask Me Anything site, you know, which is based on an anonymity, and it's uh, free to use, and it uses targeted ads. Um, I think, that, I mean, that's maybe a good case to just throw out there to, to start the discussion. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, from what's the challenge mm -hmm. Um, posed by the expectation that a business could s give somebody a choice between saying, okay, we can either show you targeted ads or you can pay us, I don't know, you could pay us a fixed amount now or you could pay us an, a, a certain amount every month. I mean, obviously, there are businesses that work like that on the internet. I mean, um, you know, we, we established that nobody here pays for everything they use online, but I expect many of us probably have a newspaper subscription or something like this. What's the challenge in, in asking a, a, a company or a small company based on the internet to give users that choice? Um, what, what effect does that have on a, on, a, on, a, on a business? Or why is it a difficult mm -hmm. question, I suppose? I mean, in our case, we would say startups start out with a, with a great idea and take it from there. They make rational choices and they pick the revenue stream model, which works best for them. And, you know, from the outset, one, one would say that you know, policy shouldn't prescribe or prohibit any, any way here. And you know, depending on what you're offering or you know, what your platform is, is, is offering, um, no, there might not be a critical market size. You might have 
uh, a million variables to look at here when you make the choice for your, uh, for your revenue stream. And um, so that's one thing. From the outset, there shouldn't be you know, a prohibition or, or, or push into one way or the other. And the other would be that um, you, can't, you can't switch horses midway in, through the race uh, and suddenly decide to change your revenue model. At least as a startup, this would be something which is rather complicated. Happy to elaborate on it, but uh, yeah. Uh, if I may... Yeah, you've written research mm. on this. So uh, so. Yeah, I think, well, absolutely right. So the kind of barrier to entry would actually be uh, higher uh, if we were looking at payment systems because it's obviously easier to get kind of a baseline audience um, if you offer your services at least at no monetary costs um, and instead for an interaction with advertising. The other thing that we came across in our study was that the particular issue with installing a payment system even next to traditional targeted ads is that at the moment we're looking at an advertising system and um, probably you can kind of support this a little bit that is so complicated and has so many diverse actors and is um, managed in a pretty much autonomous way with um, lots of algorithms taking decisions and even, and that's I think the main point, enabling a monetization of the long tail of content and that's particularly important for publishers, um, which otherwise would not have been monetizable without targeted ads. And here we're talking about micro transaction with fractions of euro cents for each click, which possibly many of us would even be willing to pay if, if a site would ask you, would you be willing to pay one hundredth of a cent for looking at this particular content? Yes, possibly yes, um, because it doesn't matter to me. But the thing is, if you were to go down that route, even the opportunity costs involved in the payment process would be, I don't know, 20, I don't know, in this particular case, even a thousand times or a hundred thousand times larger than the actual value that is exchanged. So we found that quite prohibitive um, to positioning payment systems always and in each case as a valid alternative to targeted advertising. That's not saying that they cannot be an alternative in specific cases, which you've mentioned that many um, sites and even met quite a few publishers are actually uh, successful with subscription models. So we, so far we've talked in terms of websites and online publishing. I, I want to bring Michaela in here because I'd like to ask how do whether you, I mean how do the the economics of this and also the practicalities of this differ when you're talking about mobile apps? How does this question play out in in the app space? Well, I have to echo was what Benedict was saying about the importance of not changing business models or not forcing uh, a change in the business model and the market choices uh, from a policy perspective. I think that's very important. And if we look at the numbers, um, app developers rely heavily on uh, target, targeted advertising. It is one of the main revenue streams. Um, there was a recent research that, um, that found out that over 38% of developers rely on that uh, for their revenues. Uh, the others look at, um, at mixed um, business models or they look at subscription, they look at, um, at um, uh, in-app purchases, etc. But what's to be said is that the, the most relevant revenue uh, source is still targeted advertisement, and it's super important. There was a JFK personalized advertising study that found out that in Germany and um, I think in Germany, 82% of SMEs uh, rely on that, 84% in France, 87% in the UK. I mean, we're talking about really big numbers. And coming in and saying, this is not something that you can do anymore, mm. is, is heavily, heavily disruptive. And we still believe that, to be fair, in order to, uh, to ensure the same level of innovation, the same level of, uh, of user experience, et cetera, you need to allow usage of data. So, and this doesn't apply exclusively to targeted advertising, but it's, it's a little bit across the spectrum of using data to provide free content. And in the, and in the sector of, of app developers, is beyond that. Right. 
So just just to drill down a little bit in terms of kind of where this this regulatory push is coming from. I mean, obviously, if you don't want to see ads, you already have the means to stop it. Now, ad blockers are easily available, and and the the, the impetus for this for this this measure seems to be that obviously some websites respond to ad blockers by by blocking access, and it's it's that's the the case where this requirement to give a choice would apply because if if you don't block people's access to a website you you, you wouldn't be, um, be 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 subject to this so I think I'm going to put the next question on this is about ad blockers to to Townsend um, lots of people use ad blockers when when they browse the internet either because they find ads annoying I mean I think that's probably a bigger factor than than data concerns actually I mean some people may do it for privacy reasons but I'm not convinced that's the primary reason um, now obviously that's a challenge for um, providers of, of, of ad supported content and it's a challenge for the advertisers that support the content uh, and that's why some websites say look if you want to access our website um, you've got to turn your ad blocker off um, but my question is how do we get to a stage where users no longer feel motivated to use ad blockers in the first place. What needs to happen um, where we accept uh, ad-supported content? Um, well, I'd like to, I'll, I'll answer that, and then I think it would be interesting to get back to what the Parliament really decided and, uh, and, and what the implications of that would be in a little bit more detail mm -hmm. and, and what, um, what approach it reflects on the notion of consent and maybe connect that to the earlier discussions because I find it really interesting that there seems to be a completely different discussion about consent and whether users can make informed, uh, give informed consent in the context of digital advertising, um, uh, uh, where in, in, in lots of cases the, 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 the um, information points are quite trivial um, and yet a less, not that same discussion in the context of health and, and other what appear to me more, more, more serious contexts. But um, so I think that, that um, uh, you know, the digital advertising industry has to recognize that ad blocking um, is attractive um, because um, there are lots of obnoxious ads. And actually, um, I think that the biggest deployers of ad blockers are gamers who are more teed off by the, the, the way advertising slows down um, uh, you know, it's latency more than, uh, the, than the intrusiveness of the ads. And, and the intrusiveness of the ads are, has arisen because of the, the original business model, um, which was that the, um, the publisher got paid on the basis of actions taken by the um, user. Um, clicks, you're more likely to click on somebody that gets in your way, whether you, you even want to or not. Um, but that, that got, got the dynamic going of somebody that would grab your attention and, and be you know, at any meet, um, uh, obnoxious. So I think the industry is, is, you know, massively conscious of the cost of that now. Ad blocking in Europe, on average, is sort of between is between 20 and 25 percent um, uh, for for um, you know publishers. On average, I actually don't know what the, um, the discrete publisher populations per country are, but it's but it's a, it's a, it's high. It's not doesn't seem to be growing as fast as it was two or three years ago. Um, but the industry has definitely you know figured out that there's a problem, and we have a global coalition that has done some um, really expensive research to ascertain what are the most obnoxious and the most offensive and annoying ads and um, ad, ad formats, and um, and is trying to purge those um, from uh, well from from the system. And then we'll probably get to to other things like the like the latency. Um, and as you say, um, data protection um, seems to be a, a secondary or tertiary uh, concern with respect to ad blocking. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, yeah. maybe yeah. if I can jump uh, here on the um, on why and when people will stop using ad blocker. I think what needs to be recognized as well is the relevance of ads. And this is an issue that comes up uh, very often in discussing the current e-privacy proposal. So many players say, uh, we don't want to uh, cancel, to erase completely um, advertising from the internet, but maybe this surveillance based targeted advertising is something bad that we want to get rid of. And maybe industry should go back to contextual advertising, so non-targeted advertising. But we have done a lot of research on, in this area, and actually the advertising that is very annoying for users, besides what Tony was explaining uh, before, is advertising that it's absolutely not relevant. So that's annoying. It's not the advertising per se. It's the non-relevant advertising. So that's why 
the, the very same idea of targeted advertising, of providing user with some, something that might potentially interest them, mm -hmm. uh, could make them less likely to consider it annoying or to have to use that blockers. And maybe finally, also maybe just a better understanding um, that that uh, that that all the content on, and services online, you know, and, and quality news and things on which our democracies depend, have to be paid for somehow. And that mm. it's um, you know there is no such thing as a free lunch, and it's a tragedy of the commons kind of problem. And if people, if there were greater awareness of of of, of that, um, the social contract maybe that you talked about at the beginning, um, uh, you know, and um, that I think that that is something that could contribute to. It positive you, evolution. You also said you wanted to talk about what yeah, the details Yeah, because I just Parliament's wonder whether everyone proposal. understands what the European Parliament's first reading in the e-privacy um, proposal did. I mean, so I don't, I want to talk about all the amendments, but um, a really important amendment for us was that um, basically um, the, uh, an amendment to Article 8 would make it impossible for um, a, a website or any online service to deny access um, to a user merely because the user um, um, elected not to consent to data processing uh, for advertising, for example. Um, so sort of you, you decide your business model, um, you, you put your wares out there, this is the, this is the proposition, and um, the, the law would in essence give a user the right to have exactly the same identical user experience um, with no ads as, as someone, uh, as someone uh, with, with ads. And interestingly, this, this um, would have an effect then not only on targeted advertising, um, but all advertising, even contextual advertising, requires some um, accessing or using the processing capabilities of a, of a user device. Um, so would, would require required consent under the privacy directive, and um, so um, frequency capping, saying you know making sure somebody doesn't see see the same ad 600 times, um, 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 making making sure a publisher being able to prove to an advertiser that an ad was actually delivered in order to be paid. So yeah. that's data processing that arguably is not necessary to deliver the the news site or whatever it is you're, you're looking at, but it, um, it would be indirectly at least necessary for funding it. Um, so um, if the user refuses to consent, um, gets the access to the same experience, um, but that data processing can't be done, then it just makes the advertising business model commercially inoperable. You have no way of incentivizing people um, to, to go for a funded, financed, financially sound um, experience because the law would give them the right to just um, um, to take whatever they, um, well, well, to have the, the, the non-funded experience. And ultimately that obviously is going to undermine the quality of, of, of media and the quality of the services that are available and, um, and, um, um, and, and user choice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one one other small point about is is um, you know that the, the there is the, there is an important user dimension of being able to um, um, b being able to to choose which things you subscribe to and which things you want to watch for free, and so um, a, a sort of nanny state law that um, uh, purports to overprotect you from what might be the your own um, poor choices or inability to exercise consent. Um, ultimately um, might, might deprive you, me, other people who want to exercise that, that choice of the possibility. And that seems um, a kind of tyranny in the, in the other direction, actually. Um, so I think this is the, you know, the title today was The Social Contract for Data, and, and this is the first time a panelist has, has used that expression today. So I'm, thank you for mentioning The Social Contract, because um, as I said at the start, this is the area where I think the debate is most heated, especially over the last few weeks. Um, and yet it's, it's also the most obvious one in the sense that we're all consuming this, this content for free. H how do we get, you know, I'm, I'm gonna put this to Cecilia because obviously Facebook's been in the news a lot um, over the last few weeks. And, and, and the argument, I mean, it's not all, it's not, a, it's not a specifically a privacy debate. It pulls together a lot of different concerns and privacy is one of them, but it also you know, pulls in you know, this this idea of, of filter bubbles and and you know, the the incentives involved in the kind of the attention economy. Um, but the fact is, I think when when I asked at the beginning who would pay 
to use Facebook. I think I saw two hands go up. Um, are there in most people, but, but most people I think here are pro. How, who is on, on Facebook? Almost all of you. There's a handful of it who are not. Um, that, so people want to use this. Um, they don't want to pay for it, but they're also worried about advertising. So my question is, how, I was going to say, how do we unpick this? But I think, first of all, as a company, how do you propose to try and unpick the problem? And then as, as an industry, how do you know, um, we get to a stage where um, there's some kind of truce, I think, over free content and how it's paid for? Yes, uh, well, this is a very interesting point because um, so on the one side, we have uh, users that value uh, somehow the experience, uh, particularly on Facebook, because they use Facebook on one side. And then on the other side, there is uh, some kind of uh, they, they are kind of worried about their uh, the, the use of their data, how privacy is protected and so on and so forth. Then you have issues like the Cambridge Analytica uh, revelations happening. And, uh, and we at Facebook, we are in a phase where we are asking ourselves very hard questions. And we try to really, um, to really take an approach of uh, and, and, and really asking how can we ensure that the, the, two, the two elements are, are brought together and how can we um, how can we regain trust that, that users uh, have lost or are losing? So on one side, um, the free service. I think uh, the, one of the ideas at the basis of, uh, of Facebook and one of, the, one of the deep beliefs of the Facebook founder was to create an experience that was really democratically universal as much as possible. So his idea was that everybody would have a personalized experience, but with the same condition. So there is no Facebook um, which is uh, with advertisement, which is for free, or a version of Facebook without advertisement that is paid for, a kind of luxury uh, version of Facebook. So that's, that's the basis of uh, the reason, I, and I think one of the, as I said, the deep belief of, of uh, why Facebook was created. Now, it is obvious that uh, advertising and therefore the use of personal data for uh, advertising purposes goes with some concerns from users. So what we're trying to do um, be, with GDPR, so with the General Data Protection Regulation being implemented uh, very soon, and uh, also, as, a, as I said, as a general rethinking approach uh, on how can we ensure that people trust our service. We are really trying to put people more in control of what they do on Facebook and to be much more transparent about what's happening. So what we are gonna roll out with GDPR is um, kind of a portal call, called Privacy Shortcuts where people will be able in an easy way to see what's happening with their personal data, how they can control their privacy settings. Uh, they will be able to see exactly everything they have ever uh, shared with Facebook since the beginning. They will be able to delete this and so on and so forth. So there is really this kind of effort to empower users more to, to address somehow this, this problem of trust. Now, of course, on the other side, uh, it's not enough to provide information. The information needs to be relevant. It needs to be easy to understand. It, does, it needs to be short because we all agree that those lengthy data policy uh, terms that are formed by pages and pages are really, I mean, not even myself, I can go through probably the first two pages. So it's really this fine balance between uh, protecting uh, one of the ideals that are the basis of, uh, of Facebook, really, and then on the other side, give more control to users, be more transparent, and make sure that the information we provide is relevant and meaningful. So we are really at this um, cr cross board, I would say, at this, uh, this very important moment where I really hope we are going to manage mm. to make things right. And, uh, and we are also open to feedback. So uh, again, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very happy in the Q&A session to, to take any questions about that. Okay. 
Um, if I may just add to this, I think like clearly there is there is a peak in the discussion now about Facebook because of the latest news. But I think that the trust issue is an issue that is very much cross-cutting for the whole industry. And I think that um, as Cecilia was saying, making an effort in being more transparent is more transparent is definitely uh, essential. Uh, so explaining to users exactly what kind of data is being shared, why is it being done like that, what kind of third party are getting access to it, what they're doing to, the, to this data is essential. We as Developers Alliance are trying to encourage our members, developers, to be um, to behave following uh, certain principles, but we also do believe that the GDPR is going to have an impact on that. It's going to create more transparency, more control. So this is why bringing it back to policy, bringing it back to the privacy regulation, this is why we've been pushing on the parliament with little success. Hopefully the member states will listen better to wait and see how the GDPR unfolds before going in. Especially then, I mean, if we talk about online advertising, we believe that there is, I mean, there was quite, a, quite the core, at the core of certain parts of the GDPR. So that's going to change. It's going to improve. And coming in with a new set of rules is just going to disrupt em enormously. And for smaller uh, companies, like the ones that the Developers Alliance uh, represents, and Benedict too, it's, this is what really represents the bigger issues. Changing regulatory frameworks, uh, uncertainty, this really doesn't help uh, smaller companies that are investing heavily in compliance that uh, rely heavily on investment. And invest in investment comes when there's a predictable and stable environment. So, okay. Renee, I, I'd like to put a question to you. I, I can see that the, the Tani wants to get in as well, and I'll, so I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, the, I mean, the, the, the panel's view on the regulatory side here seems pretty clear. So I think w what I'd like to get to, and, we, and we've, answered this, we've also answered the question about trust, but there does seem to be a, a, um, a, a gap, a difference between people, people's behavior as economic actors using free content online and then what people say they're concerned about in response to, and as, and as Michaela said, it, it's not just in, you know, the Cambridge Analytica scandal is, is just what we're talking about at the moment. The, the, there is a, a cross-industry concern about the role of data. And as I said, I, I don't think it's just about privacy either, because there, there are concerns about what happens when you get shown news content that you're likely to enjoy rather than what you need to, to read. How do we account for this kind of gap between what people feel and what they say they feel and how they behave in the economy? Um, in other words, I suppose, how do we separate the politics from the economics? Or, how do, or rather, how do we bring them together? Might be a better way to put that question. That's a hard nut to crack, isn't yeah. it? Um, yeah, I mean, we, I think we are, well, as we sit here, pretty much all familiar with the idea of the privacy paradox, which is exactly what you just described, people. Um, when you ask them directly, being very concerned about their privacy, and being very concerned about what happens with their data, but in the end, not actually carrying that concern through to their actual behavior by simply, you know, clicking away terms and conditions and simply agreeing to pretty much anything you set in front of them, um, just to get to the well, free service, if you will. Um, I think, first of all, there has been quite a substantive, substan substantial literature on this subject and quite a lot of studies in it. Um, nonetheless, I think there is still a concern from my side that there is too little actual consumer research looking at how consumers deal with these specific trade-offs and how they, um, how they behave in actual situations and how they can be... Um, because we communicated to with a uh, proper language that will actually enable them to make the best of their choices and really have something like an informed con uh, consent uh, decision in front of them. So, um, and that's what we also, as a research institute, have been have been trying to to work for is to really um, try and get a study um, together that tries to do exactly that and look more specifically into how consumers um, do interact with these trade-offs and how they make decisions and how they act, 
they actually do talk about um, these decisions and the trade-offs that they have to make in real life. Um, and we are actually coming from a study back in 2014 on net neutrality that we did on behalf of Barrick, which was um, quite successful, I think, in trying to unravel how consumers deal with net neutrality and how they evaluate the different trade-offs in that topic, which is, I think, pretty much as complicated as the as the privacy discussion, at least is from, from a consumer's point of view. And what we've learned there was that one of the key success factors in that study was actually the not the, the experimental economic part, which is, of course, important, but it was actually more the qualitative part where we talked directly to consumers and we did uh, a pan-European study of consumer focus groups directly interacting with them um, and really learning how they um, talk about these issues and what language they use and what, what kind of um, drives and motivates their, their behavior um, underneath the kind of surface that you can see in, in a quantitative research. So I think um, that's something that is direly needed in this debate um, and would, I guess, help also to find policy, to help policymakers find um, proper and suitable solutions for the issues that are in front of them. Okay. Uh, Tani, I, you, I know you wanted to come in. Um, only uh, just in, in um, to, to uh, to sort of leverage the, the workshop spirit of the discussion and, um, and, and raise this issue of, of how one, um, of, of how we, how, it's, it's a conundrum that the, 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 the freely given um, informed consent um, thing. Uh, so there is this anxiety. Um, uh, on the one hand, da data processing for digital advertising is, is completely legal. But on the other hand, um, the conditions around granting consent um, that there can be no asymmetry um, between the, the user and the data controller, that, that there can be no detriment. If you suffer well, what, what any does that mean, detriment. Asymmetry? So, so consent is not, you know, the, the structure of the law is that you have to have a legal basis in order to process data. Right. And there are basically two that are relevant for um, our, our industry. It's basically consent and legitimate interest. Um, consent can only be used if it is freely given. This is actually a concept that's as old as the 1995 directive, but it's really, really been built out in the GDPR, arguably to the point where it's going to be very difficult for anyone to use. And um, so one idea is that you, aren't, you can't freely, um, uh, that there must be no duress or no pressure. Um, you, you, there, so you cannot be um, impotent versus a, a powerful data controller. Um, there can, you can suffer no detriment. If you suffer detriment um, by withholding your consent, um, then the consent legal basis can't be used. Imagine that following the e-privacy regulation, all we have is the consent legal basis. Do I suffer detriment if I can't access um, um, uh, um, a popular website, a popular online service. I probably do, no. and therefore I probably won't be able um, to. I, uh, th therefore, consent probably will not be an available legal basis for the controller. If consent is the only legal basis, you know, where does the the internet just comes crashing down? Yeah. So, um, so it's yeah, it's um, this is a super challenging um, time, and 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 I think there it has. I'm not sure it's it's all been really thought through. Um, in, in, in that way. And um, so, so think tanks like yours can um, probably contribute. Yeah, and, and that's, that's what this discussion's for. Uh, Benedict, I, I, I saw you look over a few times and you, you probably should have known I was gonna pick on you <laughs> at some point soon because you've been quiet for a while. So um, I'm interested by the, this point that Tani raised about asymmetry. Um, because obviously the, the companies the, um, that join Allied for Startups are, are not big, powerful corporations. They're really small um, startups. And you know, they're providing, in many cases, providing content funded by data. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm interested by this idea of, of, of duress and that if you, that obviously, yeah, you suffer detriment if you don't share your data and you don't get the content. Well, you've, that, that's an opportunity cost. That's content you could have had that you don't have. Um, so this, this implicitly seems to suggest that you have a right to content that other people are paying for using their data or other people are supplying their data to make advertisers mm. pay for it. Um, I mean, 
I suppose, first of all, the obvious question is what does that mean for small businesses? But the second part is, is how can, what can small businesses do about it? I mean, taking it from a, from a startup perspective, I would just start out by saying that, you know, you don't start with a huge cons uh, customer base. One of the ways to get market entry is to offer a free trial or a freemium version or something like that and to s achieve scale quickly. Um, so, you know, one of the startups we worked with, for instance, was, is called Ludwig.guru in, in, in Italy. And they are, you know, a free linguistic translation service provider. You can go on, on, online and you can look up a phrase or translate it or something. And of course, on the right side, you, you see an advertisement. Um, and this is how they are trying to achieve scale to, to you know, to, to offer their service for free and, and ramp up and, and get scale. And um, later on, they tried to, you know, have a subscription for, you know, a better service and uh, ad free service. Um, I couldn't imagine how they were to enter the market if they had to have an upfront subscription or an upfront payment as a right. free linguistic translation. Um, and I just, yeah, on that, so that's what I would say on, on, on that point. And on the, just wanted to add on the prior point that I definitely agree that there's something to be said about clarity, um, informing users up front, you know, about how we finance ourselves with ads or with, with you know, we, we use your data for this and that, or we, we, need, we need to subscribe. Uh, I just wanted to also echo that uh, point again. Yeah. And the, the point you made about scale mm. brings us back to the earlier point about ad blockers, because mm. it seems that obviously a lot of websites you can visit with the aid of an ad blocker and they won't stop you accessing it. And that's presumably because they have enough. I and mean, I think, Tony, you, you said it was 25% of people using ad blockers, which is higher than I expected. Um, I didn't realize it was that, it was that high. But um, if you're a website with a lot of users, um, the other 75% might be bringing enough, enough revenue to kind of subsidize the 25% free riding. And I think I would take from Benedict from what you said that for a smaller company or for a brand new company, um, that's, not a, that's just not an option because the, the subsidy is not coming from anywhere. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would, I would, yeah. I mean, I think maybe just one thing that could be added is that, I mean, the difference between smaller companies and bigger ones is that the smaller ones don't have established brand, don't have established user relationship. Right. And this is where the problem comes into play when you have to charge for your service because you don't have a name, so the one, no one knows about it. No one can say that your service is worth the money that you're asking for it. So. And then another condition for legality of consent under the GDPR is that you can't do any, you can't force people to consent to any data processing that's not necessary to deliver the service. So we'll have a whole debate. I mean, there'll be fascinating case law, I think, about mm -hmm. whether advertising, it, you know, do you need to pay the journalist in order to deliver the news? I, I don't know. We'll find out. But, um, but, but, but uh, you know, if that is, is seen, and it was certainly intended by the G GDPR rapporteur as an impediment, to the use of advertising. I mean, how indeed would you get these little services off the ground if you didn't have? And and maybe one you know one other point is that we always, there everyone posits this kind of false dichotomy. It's either subscription or advertising. But my gosh, you know, media historically were an oligopoly business. Um, in in the on the internet, you have perfect perfect competition. You know, no margins. It's hard enough. Um, to, to, to finance um, uh, quality news anyway, and, it, and it, it shouldn't be, or, or other valuable services of any kind. I don't speak for the, the media. Mm. Um, but it should be evident that, that it, it, it doesn't make sense that the law imposes this, this, this as I say, false dichotomy. Why, why, why wouldn't you have subscription and um, advertising and any other revenue stream you can possibly think of to keep your correspondent in Kabul or wherever it is? So I was expecting, and actually in a, in a peevish way, hoping that, that this debate would be the one that was most engaging for the audience just because it's, it's something that we're all involved in and it's so much in the news. So we've got 15 minutes until Residence Palace crack open the wine. And <laughs> during that 15 minutes, I, I really want to encourage the audience to, to get involved here because, I mean, a, f a few of you have, have mentioned recent events over the last few weeks already. Um, is, is there any questions anyone would like to ask or any points anyone here would like to raise. Um, okay, gentleman at the back. Thank you again. Uh, it, happened, uh, it happened in 2008 and my Facebook account for four years it was out. 
so uh, it was done a lot of research, a lot of work with the, um, the DG Connect during the time it was not DG Connect, and it was understood that uh, we cannot do anything with Facebook or with Google Plus or with any kind of these uh, American-based organizations, which they are doing their work. You are doing your work. Uh, how 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 you are doing your work? This is not for us to judge. What we know is that the data we cannot handle. During the, the Congress meeting with, Mr., uh, uh, with, uh, with the gentleman who is the owner of your organization, it was asked a, a question because we have the shadow profiles uh, problem, which means that people which are not in the Facebook, uh, they are controlled by you because uh, of the systems, of the scanning of the photographs, of technical issues. They are controlled. So, if somebody leaves Facebook and after 90 days, as you claim, uh, the, the, his data are disappeared, you follow uh, what's going on. As Mr. Zuckerberg told to the to a congressman over there, to his question, uh, even though he's not existing in Facebook. <coughs> so, uh, these are things which uh, they are on the security level. We cannot uh, 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 discuss it here. In the level we are discussing, of course. It's a general discussion which is needed. But in a deeper level, we cannot control the data, even though you, you, you made some uh, ameliorations to your system by bringing them all together for the users. But the most of the users, the 95%, they don't know about computers. They use them as uh, appliances, which, uh, as uh, devices, which uh, only to serve basic needs of them. So the, uh, the thing is that we as Europeans, we need to build our own platforms as we propose. Because the lady before on the previous panel told that we, we, we are against. No, we are not against the progress, but we are to the European side. We ha and this is good for Facebook and for Google Plus and for all the Americans, because they have competition. This is what we are talking about. We are talking for the CNET as a, a European internet where the user can switch if he finds better services to the internet. We are speaking for platforms, social networks with 3D, which we can build in Europe. Instead, the, the European students, you, the youth, you are leaving Europe and you are going to the States and you are paid over there. When we can keep you here, we can build our own platforms and we can compete with the Americans. Thank you very much. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and um, render a, a, that as a question. Um, can Europe build platforms that compete with the American platforms in a way that people will want to use them and which will be economically viable? Is that a fair price of, of your question? Okay. The the when you say the current administration, you mean in 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 here in Brussels. Okay. So it, it, it's a fair enough question for the panel. Can Europe come up with platforms that would be viable to compete with um, the the big American platforms, and how would they do it? How I mean, how would they be funded to get to the heart of this question? Is it possible? I it's always interesting to see uh, talk about you know where is Europe's Google, where is Europe's yeah. Facebook, um, and you know one of the questions we ask is you know do we want uh, it exactly like that, um, or you know is, can we do something distinctly European? Now um, speaking on behalf of members in Europe of ours or startups in Europe, we definitely think that uh, you know something uh, we can put forward definitely is you know good privacy re regulation. Uh, and GDPR is something that everyone's going for now. And from our perspective, trust is absolutely key. If you, you know, if there's a big chat application or whatever, you, everyone's using, but you don't trust them, you're kind of stuck with them. If you don't trust a startup, it's a swipe away deletion, or you can, you can render their service, you can discontinue their service tomorrow. So trust is absolutely paramount for startups in Europe right now. And, you know, I, I, I would just, you know, challenge, you know, challenge the audience member do we want a Silicon Valley in Europe, or you know, because we are we are observing startup hubs in Berlin, in Paris, in Warsaw, who are doing you know some very interesting things in some very interesting sectors, um, and um, I, I would leave it at that for for now. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe if I can add to that, I am sure that Europe has the potential to develop um, the next. Facebook or Google, mm -hmm. and it really depends on what it's going to look like. But 
Europe doesn't lack the talent to come up with these kind of solutions. There's a lot of great uh, realities. There's a lot of uh, companies that are members of my association, of, of Benedict's association, of other associations. Uh, the problem is that uh, one of the problems that is there in Europe, apart from uh, some issues with accessing the venture capital is uh, is regulation. I mean, the the regulatory framework in Europe is not necessarily uh, very supportive of startups. They're not really, it's not really helping startups grow and scale. It's actually putting a lot of boundaries, creating a lot of obstacles to their growth. Uh, there is uh, there is a, a bigger attention in the last few years to regulating the digital space, as I mean, as it's normal because of the of how big it is and how important and relevant it's being. But the attention of the regulators is always on big companies. Um, the reality is that there's a lot of unintended consequences, and a lot of the unintended victims are smaller European companies. So, and maybe if, if I may, I just wanted to add a very quick point. I think we also shouldn't forget how European are, are some of the companies that uh, that you mentioned, Facebook, Google. Who is on on Facebook and who uses Google? Mostly and a big percentage of, of those people and those uh, SMEs, they are European SMEs. So I, I, I brought some, um, some numbers, some stats. We had some, uh, um, some survey in, in a couple of uh, European member states, uh, France, Germany, Italy, Poland, and Sp Spain, and UK. And 35% of the, uh, those SMEs that we, that we ask questions to have built their business on Facebook. 49% say they have hired more employees due to grow since joining Facebook. 57% say they have increased sales because of the platform. So uh, I, I just think we should resist this idea that there are the big US companies that don't invest in Europe and then they are... So I, I, no, absolutely. I just think it's important to to keep this in mind and to keep in mind that uh, we are really willing to invest in Europe more and more. So, so the, this point leads me to think definitely we would absolutely support the new European Facebook. But it's also true that Facebook helps European businesses as well. But I, I think the gentleman has, has, has made his thoughts clear on this. Um, and I, I want to bring us back to the, the point of the panel, um, which is, I mean, how we all get involved in this, this, this free economy that we're, that we're consuming. And, and the, the absence of big European players in this space is certainly worth talking about. Um, so I think, I mean, the, 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 I'm trying to find the right way to put this, this question. Um, we're not short of startups in Europe. We have loads of those. It's, it's, it's getting them into big companies. And there, there do seem to be challenges in terms of uh, access to venture capital, as you said. I think language may be a challenge, too, that you know, the United States has a... Every, everyone can speak English, whereas in Europe it's, it's more of a kind of... A, it's, it serves as a lingua franca, but it's not everyone's um, first language. But if, if we bring it back to this idea of, of content being funded by the monetization of data, um, how does, well, the regulatory framework that we have now and the one that we look likely to have within the next couple of years, and we don't really know how long it's going to take free privacy to get settled, um, what effect does that have on the ability to build these types of free to use but profitable services in a European context? How, how much harder is it to do that in Europe or is it harder to do that in Europe? I think I can see Rene nodding his head, so that means he's <laughs> going to get picked on next. Uh, right, yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, um, as part of the privacy study that we conducted for the German government uh, back in November, we were looking exactly at that at that point, in a way, because uh, we were tracing back the digital advertising revenues in Europe and in the US. And when you look at sort of population size um, and internet usage, I think it's, well, it's not exactly the same, of course, but it's comparable. Um, and um, when you look at the numbers, um, both in absolute value and in the growth rate that you um, observe from 2008 
or 2007 up until 2014, they are almost in parallel. So sometimes one wins a little bit more and sometimes the other, but overall it doesn't make a big difference. Um, whereas by 2014, the US trend literally decouples from the European trend and is um, accelerating much, much more quickly um, since then. So in any case, and we did an estimate of um, how much uh, revenue the e-privacy would po probably take out in the short term from the, from the digital um, advertising. Um, but no matter how big this number exactly is, what I think is clear and, and what is also stated, I think, also by, by policymakers is that revenues will decline in the online advertising business in Europe um, if this uh, regulation enters into force in the way it's proposed. Um, and this, to answer your question, would then um, even enhance the effect that we are currently witnessing in terms of the um, the increasing spread between the money that is going into online platform businesses in the US versus the money that is going in the same types of businesses in, in Europe. And I think we all know that um, quite, a, quite a substantial bit of that money is then again reinvested in quite important innovations that Europeans are also keen on having. Um, things like artificial intelligence, things like autonomous cars and other interesting future technologies. So um, what I'm trying to say here is that, yes, there is um, a very strong effect of that regulation on, on the funding bit of online platforms, and it would certainly not, um, not improve the situation for um, online businesses, online startups in Europe, um, much, um, much more the opposite indeed. If I may add to this, um, we commissioned a study recently um, to calculate the economic impact of the privacy regulation. And um, we clearly, I mean, the, the, stu the study will be ready next year, most likely. Um, and um, we asked the company that, uh, that run this, this exercise to look not only at the impact on the digital sector, but and not, not, nor only to the adjacent sectors, but a little bit in general on the European economy. And the results are quite scary, to be fair, because the estimation is that the proposed privacy regulation will cost 550 billion annually in uh, reduced turnover and economic losses of up to 58 billion euros a year. And what the study actually found is also that, um, apart from what we've been talking about, um, um, targeted advertising, et cetera, and the digital um, and the free online uh, content, which is the topic of this, of this, of this panel, but still, um, the privacy is going to have a much wider uh, target range because virtually every industry uses data for one way or the other. And targeted advertising is one of the ways that data is being used, but some, in some cases data is really used to provide, to enable a specific service. In other cases, it's used to identify uh, new market opportunities, to design new products, in our case, new applications. Um, so it's, it's really, uh, the impact is quite, uh, can be quite dramatic, so. Okay, so it's now 20 past five. So I wanna finish on a high note for European business. Um, so today we've, we've had panelists from, among other countries, France and Italy and Greece and Hungary and Romania, all of which are wine-producing countries. <laughs> and I have just seen the Residence Palace staff placing a few bottles just outside the door. Um, so I'd like you all to, first of all, thank our panelists for joining us. Please give them a round of applause. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I, I'm aware that you had a lot of choices of events to go to today. It's, it's a really busy day. And you, know, you also ran the gauntlet with all the security outside for whatever it is that's going on next door. Um, so really, thank you for, for coming today. It's great to see you. And, and please keep in touch. We, we like to keep the conversation going. I didn't mention at the start that uh, we intend to write a report on this topic and, and these conversations are really useful for us in, in getting some ideas. Um, so thanks for coming and thanks for making this work. Thank you. Thanks Nick.